happy. Say hi, buddy. Hi. Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Mitchell, and thank you for tuning in for Bible study tonight. We're so glad that you came and decided to be a part of the study tonight. I got a special guest with me. He's, he's hanging out with Daddy today. Uh, but if you're here on our on our conference call line, our Zoom line, thank you for calling in. If you're here via our Facebook page, thank you. And we ask that you will share so that somebody knows uh, that we're in Bible study now. And if you're with us via our YouTube page, will you just type in the comment section so that we know that you're here. We're glad that you're here. Jordan, aren't you glad? Say yay. Very good. Thank you for being with us today. So if you've been with us over the last few months, we have been traveling through the Bible. We've been in a series called Strength. For the sisters, strength for the sisters. And we've looked at very various different sisters in the Bible um, who we have seen stories of folks who are prominent and some not so prominent women in the Bible. And over the last few weeks, we've concluded this series by going through the book of Ruth. If you were with us last week, I talked from chapter three of the book of Ruth. And today we're going to conclude our series in the book of Ruth. And we have none other than our director of Christian education, Deacon Beverly Wynn, who is going to help us now. I hope that you have a pen, some paper, something to take notes as Deacon Wynn leads us into the final installment of our Strength for the Sisters uh, lessons tonight. Come on, Deacon Wynn. She's in the boardroom. She's ready to go. Let's hear the word of God taught to us by Deacon Beverly Wynn. Come on, Deacon Wynn. Say yay. All right, Deacon Wynn, it's on you. Hello, and welcome to Bible study. This evening, we're continuing our study of the book of Ruth, and we're in chapter four. First, let's pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Parent, we thank you for this day and we invite you into this period of study. Open our eyes and our hearts and our minds. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay. So, let's open your Bibles to chapter 4, or if you're watching, you can follow on the screen. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz said, come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, sit here, and they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. No, for no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malone. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Malone's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family, or from his hometown. Today, you are witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman 
who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. Boaz, the father of Obed. Obed, the father of Jesse and Jesse, the father of David. Okay, now I'm going to ask us to take a trip down memory lane. This is our icebreaker question. Was there a typical protocol that dates went through when first introduced to your parents or guardians? Now let me help you with that. The question is, was there a typical protocol that dates went through when first introduced to your parents or guardians? For example, did your parents or guardians ask a lot of questions when you first introduced them? Or maybe they asked you a lot of questions afterwards. So yes or no, just put that in the chat box if, if you would. Did you have a lot of questions asked or did you ask a lot of questions maybe of your own children when they bought dates in? Were there a lot of questions? So now let's see. Did you ever hear any of these questions? Um, what did you say his name or her name was and preferably first and last? Um, wh where did you say they live on what side of town? Um, what do they do? Um, what church do they go to? Um, and, and where did you say you were going? And if it was a male, uh, maybe what type of car is he driving? Does he have a valid permit? Uh, what about insurance? So do any of these questions or comments sound familiar to you? And what would you have on your list? All right, so going back to our, our text. Um, let's look at who's who and who was what, and we'll just sort of review quickly. So we have Elimelech of Bethlehem in Judah. He died. Naomi, the wife, the widow of Elimelech. Malone and Chilion, sons of Elimelech and Naomi, and they died. We have Ruth, the wife, the widow of Malone. We have Orpah, also a Moabite, wife, widow of Chilion. Now we have Boaz, who is a close relative, a near kinsman, in Hebrew called a goel. He's rich, he's in the family of Elimelech, uh, and we also have another character uh, who is the unnamed closer next of kin. He's addressed as friend in our text. Uh, in the Revised Standard Version, next of kin, in Hebrew, he's called Poloni Almoni or so-and-so. Now, I've added one additional item to the slide, you'll see, and it's the land. Now, the land also has importance. Uh, location and place is also a key to identity, just as a name identifies. 
uh, two quick illustrations. Um, while working on this, I was watching one of my westerns I like to watch, uh, The Big Valley. And you know, um, the, the wealthy family is, uh, the, is the Barclay family. But the land also shows up when the show is coming on. You see the pictures of the land. The land is also highlighted. And actually, the picture is not named the Barclay family. It's called the Big Valley. So we're talking about the valley, the land. Another rerun I like, Bonanza. Now, while there's the Cartwright family in the opening credits, um, and, but there's also, you will see a map. And the map is of the land. So while we have, um, you know, Ben and Adam and Hoss and little Joe and yeah, there's Hopsing, we also have the Ponderosa. And the, so the land has a name. And even when some of the cast is not there, the land is, the Ponderosa is going to be mentioned several times. So think about it also. When we get our real estate tax bills, there really are two figures. One is for the land and one for the building. So you see, land is really important. So the importance of land is portrayed in our lives and on TV shows and in the movies. Land speaks for and about the owners of record. And land plays an important role in biblical narratives such as Ruth. For the Israelites, land speaks to God's presence land speaks to identity. So going back to our icebreaker, if you think about those sample questions and questions your parents may have asked or even you may have asked, they're really focused around identity. So now what we're going to do looking at chapter four, our focus will be the great exchange. We're going to look at the property, the widow roof, um, the Moabite, and verses 1 through 12. Then we'll look at the resolution and reversal, restoration of family, a marriage and a birth, verses 13 through 17. And then we're going to talk about the genealogy, who is on that family tree, verses 18 through 22. Okay, so chapter 4, verse 1, let's look at our setting. We're at the town gate. Now the town gate, this is the place where various activities took place, such as uh, public transactions and meetings. Uh, the town gate was a high traffic area. And because it was a high traffic area, witnesses could easily be pulled together. Uh, you may have had experiences transacting business where you needed a witness, or perhaps you've been a witness for someone else. Boaz needed witnesses. So once everyone had been seated in place, Boaz told the kinsman redeemer, this unnamed man who was the closest relative, he told him the issue at hand. Boaz told the nameless kinsman redeemer that he, the kinsman redeemer, was first in line to regain control of the land. Boaz was next in line and Boaz shared that information as well. The kinsman redeemer had responded, I will redeem it, talking about the land. Then Boaz had um, added some more information. Let's look back at verse five. On the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabite, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the dead man's name with his property. So you see, there's additional responsibility required in this transaction. Earlier, we noted the importance of identity. Let's take a minute to focus briefly on the Moabites. The text identifies Ruth as a Moabite, and her ethnicity is frequently referred to in this text. She is considered a foreigner in the land of Judah. Let's look at a portion of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 23, 3 through 8, listen. No Ammonite or Moabite 
or any of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, even down to the tenth generation. For they did not come to meet you with bread and water on your way when you came out of Egypt, and they hired Balaam of Beor to pronounce a curse on you, because the Lord your God loves you. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live. So what's up with these Moabites and Ammonites? Why the exclusion? I suggest you read Genesis 19 later, but here's a snapshot. Remember Lot, he's the nephew of Abraham. Family had fled from Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot's wife had turned to a pill of salt, you remember that. Lot and his daughters were living in a cave. And then the daughters, you know, started talking to one another. Who were they going to marry? So they came up with a plan. They got daddy drunk. They slept with daddy and they conceived. All right, now the older daughter named her son Moab. He was the father of the Moabites. The younger daughter named her son Ben-Ami, and he became the descendants of the Ammonites. So you see, in biblical tradition, the Moabites and the Ammon Ammonites, the Moabites and the Ammonites, descended from Lot and his daughters. Can you understand how an identity problem might have come up as a result of this union between Lot and his daughters. Might there have been some discomfort in having these people, the Moabites and the Ammonites, connected to the family tree? So back to our text. Boaz had made it known that the land came with a widow, a Moabite widow, and the dead man's name had to be maintained on the inheritance. In verse 6, we see the relative had a change of heart. He changed his mind. In the text, it's indicated that he was concerned about the impact redeeming this inheritance would have on his own inheritance. Now, in verse 8, it said he took off his sandal, he gave it to Boaz, and in so doing, he was performing a rite of transfer. This action symbolized the transfer of the right of purchase. And then in verse 9, Boaz announced to the witnesses that he had bought the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malone, and he had acquired Ruth, the Moabite, as his wife, and through this action maintained the name of the dead with his property and the deceased name would not disappear from among his family or from the town records. Okay, so in verses 13 through 17, we see resolution and a series of reversals. Boaz married Ruth. Ruth gave birth to a son. So the future of Ruth and that of Naomi became secure through marriage, security. The male child was named Obed, which means servant. Obed's birth resulted in restoration for Naomi and really a validation for Ruth, the Moabite, who had been considered other. Boaz provided security through marriage, and so Ruth and Naomi survived. So do you see the reversals here? Remember, due to famine, a lack of food, Naomi and Elimelech had left Bethlehem. They had left the land of Judah. They had traveled to a foreign place, Moab. They had left the land. And that, leaving the land, that, that represented a great loss. Their departure had meant a separation from place, separation from land, separation from identity, separation from what's familiar. 
Elimelech, the patriot of the family, he had died. The sons Malone and Killian, they had died. Talk about grief. Loss on top of loss. Layered loss. Loss as Pastor Mitchell had talked about in our earlier chapters of Ruth. But here in chapter 4, we begin to see reversals, survival, restoration. Naomi and Ruth return. They go back to home together. And remember, although Ruth was a Moabite, a foreigner, and other, Ruth had claimed through a vow in chapter 1, Naomi's people, the home, the land, and Naomi's God as her God. Now, notice in verses 14 through 15 that the women of the town said to Naomi, let's see what they said. They didn't ask a question about her identity. Remember in chapter 1, when Naomi and Ruth had arrived in Bethlehem, the women had asked, is this Naomi? There was a recognition problem here. Now, in chapter 4, they make a declarative statement. Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without next of kin. He shall be to you a restorer of life, and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him." Now, I thought this was a pretty powerful declaration. Remember, we're focusing on strength from the sisters. Yes, Boaz represented strength and faithfulness, but strength and faithfulness were also demonstrated through the actions of Ruth, who, as these sisters said, was more to Naomi than seven sons. And this proclamation came from a group of women. So let's talk about other reversals. In the memory of the Israelites as a people, the word Moabite perhaps brought to mind disgust, distrust, disdain because of the Moabites' origins. Maybe they had some visceral reaction whenever they heard the name Moabite. However, by the end of this story, Ruth's faithfulness offered an alternative image of a Moabite woman. Boaz protected Ruth the Moabite the foreigner, the other, and through marriage and a birth, she was grafted onto the family tree. Loss and emptiness, desolation and despair were reversed. Now there's a time of harvest. That's a reversal. Return to the land. Reversal. Plenty. A claim on Yahweh. A marriage between an Israelite and a Moabite, protection, birth, an expanded family tree, a new definition of family, reversals, reversals. Do you see? There are so many more layers in this little short book of four chapters. I highly recommend a commentary on Ruth authored by professor and Hebrew Bible scholar, the Reverend Judy Fentress Williams. Um, she has her PhD in Hebrew Bible, and she's also on the staff at Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria. Her commentary on Ruth has depth, yet it's written, I think, in a manner similar to her teaching style in Bible study, the material is challenging, yet at the same time, it can be understood by the layperson who wants a deeper dive into the text. Um, I can remember in church school some months back, we studied uh, a little about Ruth. And now looking back on it, I, there, there are so many layers that we just did not uncover in this little book. Now, we've talked before about reading one text in conversation with another text. 
Well, Dr. Fentress Williams, in her Ruth commentary, pointed to Ruth, the fourth chapter, verses 18 through 22, which contains the genealogy. In conversation with the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew, in his chapter one genealogy, is reminding his readers, perhaps, that they have a history of God working in unconventional ways. The genealogy affirmed that some of Israel's greatest moments had come through individuals' unusual encounter with God in unlikely places. And perhaps some of our greatest moments as Christians might come through unusual encounters with God and God's people outside of the church building. Do you think that's a possibility? Have you ever had an encounter with God in an unlikely place? Dr. Fentress Williams writes that Ruth offers a theological vision where the faithfulness of God is not limited to land, is not limited to people, or even to Israel's understanding of God's laws. She notes that Ruth's faithfulness had crossed the boundaries of land in chapter 1, crossed the boundaries of family in chapter 2, property in chapter 3, and crossed the boundaries of history in chapter 4. God's faithfulness or Hesed, that's H-E-S-E-D, crosses the boundaries of God's creation. Ruth ends with a genealogy. Now, one purpose of a genealogy is to prove one's pedigree. Now, I know we sometimes prefer to skip those genealogies in the Bible. The names are not easily easy to pronounce. Uh, when we were reading the King James Version back in the day, we would go so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so, and then our eyes would start glazing over. But I've learned to appreciate the important information contained in biblical genealogies. So in verse 21, Bo Boaz is the father of Obed. Obed is the father of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David, and that David is the one who becomes king of the nation of Israel. So, it was through the Moabite Ruth that God demonstrated God's faithfulness, God's hesed for God's people. So remember to check out the genealogy in chapter 1 in the Gospel of Matthew, and spoiler alert, you will see the name of Ruth. So as we wrap up, perhaps these words are familiar to you. A little Gloria Gaynor, Oh no, not I, I will survive. Oh, as long as I know how to love, I know I'll stay alive. I will survive, I will survive. And how about these words, little Hezekiah Walker? I need you, you need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me, agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. You are important to me. I need you to survive. In this story of Ruth, we also get a picture of God's faithfulness and the person who embodies God's hesed. God's faithfulness is a woman. Transformation takes place through the presence of Ruth and Naomi, two widows, one an Israelite, one a Moabite. Ruth is a story about survival, strength, from the sisters. Back to you, Pastor Mitchell.
Thank you, Deacon Wynn. Thank you, Deacon Wynn, uh, for blessing us with the word of God. I'm going to take it from here. Thank you for kicking it back to me. And for those that are watching us tonight, if you have been listening to this series, listening to our teacher tonight, but you don't yet have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to invite you uh, to get connected to Christ. And for those that don't have a church home, even to get connected with our church home. If you want to do that, all you have to do is type connect in the comment section or you can type info. You can email us at info at 31sbc.org. We'd love to hear from you, whether you want to get in relationship with God for the very first time, with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, or you desire to become a part of our church family. We would love to have you as a part of the family, and you can do that by typing connect in the comment section, or you can do that um, by sending us an email. Don't forget, tomorrow we're in prayer as we are each and every Wednesday at 12 noon. You have the opportunity to join us in prayer. Um, and that information is on the screen. Uh, it is only a half hour of prayer. We, we are in and we are out. But God has been meeting us in our prayer time. We hope that you will be a part of that experience as well. We also want to let you know, for those that have been with us on our Saturday sessions, our Good Grief Saturday sessions, we're continuing in those sessions on this Saturday at 11 a.m. The same Zoom information that you would use to be a part of our prayer call, you can use that same information to be a part of our Saturday Good Grief sessions. And then you can join us on Sunday as we continue in our Good Grief series on Sunday morning worship uh, at 10.30. Now listen, for those that desire, you know that we are in phase one still in phase one of our re-entry plan and so we still have a limited amount of people that are able to be in the sanctuary but if you are interested in being in the sanctuary one of the few that's in the sanctuary you have the opportunity each and every week to call us at the church from uh, Tuesday at 9 30 a.m. Thir uh, through Thursday uh, you have the opportunity to call the church to reserve your place. You must RSVP, and whether you are a leader, a deacon, a trustee, a minister, uh, a lay leader, uh, whatever the case may be, or you just are curious about checking our church out, you have the opportunity to come, but you must RSVP. You can do so by calling the number on the screen. Once we are out of RSVP spaces, we're out. And we also ask that if you RSVP and cannot make it, please let us know so that we can make sure that we leave room for those who want to come. We want to make sure we have as much space for those that want to be a part of the experience as possible. So thank you so much for being a part of that. Well, it's time to go, family. Thank you for participating in Bible study. We start a brand new series next Wednesday, and I'm excited about it. But until we meet again, come on, Jordan, let's pray. Pray. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord God cause face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Tell everybody, say bye-bye. Bye-bye. We'll see you next time in Bible study. I love you, family. See you tomorrow in prayer. And uh, we're done, buddy. Say yay. God bless you. Have a great night. See you tomorrow in prayer.